Hi everybody, in this presentation I'd like to discuss thyroid diagnostic tests and try to simplify what I think a lot of people think is a very complex scenario or set of scenarios regarding how to choose diagnostic tests for hypo and hyperthyroidism. And we're going to use uh, a schema that I show you on the top right here uh, that is going to be something we repeat over and over again and look at different scenarios to try to simplify the explanation for why we choose a certain test over another. So here we go. In understanding thyroid diagnostic tests, everything is about understanding negative feedback. And let's first talk about normal negative feedback in the context of the um, hypothalamic pituitary thyroid axis. And we're also going to talk about um, the effect that it has on the animal, their target tissues that lead to either hypothyroidism, euthyroidism, which is normalcy, uh, and hyperthyroidism. So let's talk about euthyroidism first, the term meaning that everything's fine. And so uh, in this situation, by definition, we have uh, the TRH that's produced by the um, hypothalamus, thyrotrophic releasing hormone, is produced into a, uh, a sinus, basically, um, that cannot, it, it only connects the hypothalamus and the pituitary, so it cannot generally be easily measured. TRH cannot be measured in the circulation in general. So I've got this in uh, brackets because of that, but it should be normal under that circumstance when everything is under um, a uh, proper feedback mechanism. So what we can measure, however, is the release of, of what, what the pituitary thinks about the situation, and that's TSH, or thyrotrophic hormone, thyroid stimulating hormone, which normally stimulates the thyroid gland to produce thyroid hormone, which we're going to call for now just TH, but we'll learn later that it's T4 and T3 for the most part. Uh, and so if all of these things are in balance, and that balance is determined primarily by negative feedback, and the negative feedback is shown here and will be shown in future discussions uh, and slides as a red line, a solid red line. And when that uh, is not an adequate amount of feedback because of hypothyroidism, we'll learn, we'll show a dotted red line. The effect in this case is that the the E effect is normal. So the tissues are feeling the right amount of thyroid hormone. So let's look from here about what happens when things go awry with uh, some form of pathology. So let's look at hypothyroidism. That is the primary damage occur is occurring either from pathology or maybe you remove them surgically uh, at the gland itself. At, so we call that primary glandular dysfunction. And um, so what that means is that we're going to work backwards from the hormone that's normally produced. Thyroid hormone is in small quantity. Therefore, our negative feedback is very low. And it's telling the pituitary and the hypothalamus at both levels that there's not enough thyroid hormone. And we'll learn later that this form of thyroid hormone that it really is monitoring is the unbound form or free hormone. Uh, but for now, let's just talk about negative feedback to those sites. Those sites are not physically connected to the uh, thyroid gland or to the target tissue. And so um, these hormones are the key connectors in any, like any good endocrine circuit. So in this case, you'd predict that TRH would be high, but we can't measure it. TSH would be high. We can measure that. And thyroid hormone would be low in the classical situation. And the effect of hypothyroidism is too little thyroid hormone. So the scenarios here that we would see from a diagnostic standpoint would be primarily what I'm highlighting here, a high TSH and a low thyroid hormone level. So let's keep that in mind as we go forward. Okay. Now, in order to talk further about diagnostic tests of thyroid hormone dysfunction or hypofunction, we need to be a little more specific about the axis itself. And I mentioned before that thyroid hormone is a highly protein-bound 
uh, hormone. In fact, 99.9% uh, .9 of T4 is bound. And so let's just keep that in mind, that 99.9% is bound. And I'm representing the bound thyroid hormone here uh, as a, co a non-covalently bound T4 and the, bi the protein that it's bound to, there's a series of them, um, we'll just call it plasma binding proteins for now. So the free hormone, that is the moiety that is being monitored by the hypothalamus and the pituitary, the free T4, is the actual moiety that provides negative feedback. And, and so this adds into our thinking the actual idea that we could measure free T4, and you'll see that we, we do that in some situations. Now the other thing that we want to bring in that we hadn't discussed before is what I'm calling here the extra thyroidal axis and that is any tissue outside the thyroid gland um, not only can it take T4 from the thyroid gland and use it but it also goes through a process of either activating or inactivating so we call it act, an activation step or an inactivation step from T3 in the case of activation or reverse T3, which is inactivation. And, and it spits out some of that T3 into the circulation as well, shown here. The issue we'll talk about later is that the uh, T3 is an intracellular hormone primarily, and so its value, as we'll learn, is not that great from a diagnostic standpoint when it comes to thyroid failure. The tissues have ways of responding to lack of thyroid hormone, lack of T4, I should say. So let's move on from there. So in this diagram, I want to show the parallel between um, the, the actual uh, role of free T4, as shown here, and that, this is the moiety that is small enough, it's, not, it's the part that's not bound at any given moment that can move across the membrane and show up inside the cell and therefore be metabolized, deiodinated, or move to the, the receptors to have an action. And uh, so therefore be proportionate to the clinical result. Um, we try to simulate measurement of free T4 by a dialysis membrane shown here. In, in the parallel, this dialysis membrane is, uh, allows only small molecules across, and we uh, allow, put plasma on one side and put a buffer on the other side, and we let it come across, and then we measure the free T4. And now we don't need to get into how that's done, but um, suffice it to say, this is actually measuring not total T4, but free T4. So this diagram, I want to make the point of how important this free T4 is for a clinician and for the physiology, for that matter. So if we look at uh, the plot on the x-axis of free T4 and y-axis of TSH, you can see that there's a very uh, remarkable negatively uh, curvilinear relationship, meaning, and, we, and it's roughly exponential. So that means that as the free T4 uh, falls, so if we go from this direction to down here, you see what happens at some point beyond the critical point, TSH will start to rise. And it rises very dramatically in an attempt to recover the thyroid axis. Uh, remember, it doesn't know whether the thyroid gland is there or not. And so it is trying to have respond very quickly to get thyroid hormone to come back into normalcy. And it's this free T4, if we can measure it, and the, and the TSH, which we can measure, these two are the most tightly correlate, uh, negatively correlated uh, things for us to measure as clinicians. Now, in this diagram, let's take a look at negative feedback and action, basically. So this is a dog that's had its thyroid removed, and you can see 
uh, what we're plotting here is TSH on the y-axis and just time on the x-axis. So you can see that uh, TSH was high. The red line represents the normal, a uh, high normal range of T TSH for a dog. So we started to take this dog and administer replacement thyroid hormone at a dosage of 0 0.025 milligrams per kilogram once a day. And you can see that by two weeks, basically the TSH had come down to an unmeasurable level. Now this is the fact that it's unmeasurable and not measurable for what we consider to be a replacement, normal replacement dose has more to do with the insensitivity of the, the assay we have available in the dog. But you can see the important thing here is this is physiology in action so that we, when we take the animal off around six weeks later, you can see TSH starts marching right back up again. And then at one point we gave it a half of the dose we originally gave it, it comes down part of the way and we up the dose again, comes down into the normal range. And so the point is that the relationship between the amount of available thyroid hormone, in this case only a pill, and TSH is a negative one. And this is why for both diagnosis of hypothyroidism, TSH is going to be high, and for monitoring thyroid hormone uh, adequacy, that is replacement therapy, it actually measuring TSH has theoretical value. So let's move to some uh, recommendations that have been made by a panel, now it's 15 years ago, um, that really have stood up over time, uh, and the assays are pretty much the same that we're, we're going to be talking about. Uh, this was a uh, recommendation made to the Comparative so Society for Comparative Endocrinology in 2003, and we will use some of the observations and recommendations as our guideline here. The first thing to realize with hypothyroidism or hyperthyroidism is that history and clinical signs are important, and it's true for any diagnostic test. Do not just measure things because they can be measured. The value of a diagnostic test and its performance and its predictive value improves tremendously if there's clinical, there are clinical signs or historical uh, signs that, that have led you to make this test uh, in the begin, uh, to begin with. And so realize that thyroid function tests should not be interpreted in a clinical vacuum. Secondly, realize that other, the reasons we want to know a lot about the history and clinical signs is that other conditions can affect um, the diagnostic tests, which might lead us to need to wait for, to, re, to do that test or it might lead us to choose other tests. So in both, both hypothyroidism shown here by this dog with bilateral symmetrical alopecia or this panting cat hyperthyroidism, uh, both are multisystemic disorders requiring a full medical, internal medical workup. And these generally include CBC, biochemical screen, and your analysis, of course. Now, it's beyond the scope of this presentation to talk about all of the specific things that you might see uh, in a hypothyroid dog or a hyperthyroid cat. Um, however, just realize that it, what we're trying to do is to find corroborative evidence for the, bio, the metabolic condition and also to rule out other metabolic conditions um, and diseases that may confound our test results. Now the panel also wanted clinicians to uh, think a little bit about how frail some of our diagnostic tests are. And first of all, to realize that um, a thyroid diagnosis is not always a yes or no answer. Um, and part of the reason for this is that you can sometimes catch an animal at an earlier stage of disease where they're fluctuating into and out of the normal range, for example. Uh, and so you may get discordant results. Um, for example, a hypothyroid animal may not have an ele elevated TSH and a low T4 or free T4. Uh, there may be something 
one of those two may be in the normal range. Finally, it's important, this is mainly for dogs, dog breeds, but we need, and particularly for sight hounds, we need to realize that total T4 and free T4 values tend to be about 50% lower than in most other breed groups. Um, it's not fully understood exactly why, but it may have to do with their relative drug metabolism. Okay, some housekeeping. We want to talk about uh, some abbreviations we're going to use, acronyms. So TT4 will be total T4. TSH will be measuring endogenous TSH that is in the circulation. Free T4 uh, um, is going to be FT4, and I'll just mention now we're going to hope that if you have a chance, measure the dialysis, use the dialysis procedure for this. Total T3, TT3, and we'll mention but not spend a lot of time on the fact that anim dogs in particular can get antibodies uh, as a subset of their abnormalities that can occur in autoimmune thyroiditis, and these can, can uh, alter particularly the T4 measurements. In the, some cases, depending on the methodology chosen, the free T4 measurement. And so T4AA stands for anti-T4 autoantibodies. Okay, in both dogs and cats, we're going to talk about screening animals for, that are healthy, that don't come in with a problem, um, for a thyroid disease. Now, I told you before, just before that you should avoid um, doing some of these testing uh, procedures specific thyroid diagnostic testing if you don't have a reason to clinically or historically. Uh, however, so let's say first that let the clinical signs take you to the diagnostic tests. Realize that many things will falsely lower T4 in the dog that might be euthyroid, making it look hypothyroid, and also take a cat that's hyperthyroid and make it look euthyroid. Um, some things falsely elevate T4 and free T4 in cats. Uh, we think one of those may be uh, free fatty acids. Um, and finally here, screening for hypothyroidism in dogs without evidence of clinical problems will tend to lead to overdiagnosis. So we don't generally recommend screening of an animal without um, clinical problems. However, the converse, hyperthyroidism, Screening for hyperthyroidism in cats is something that we recommend in animals that are eight years of age or older. Some people choose a little younger, some a little bit older than that, because very few things will falsely elevate total T4. So realize the distinction. There are things that falsely lower total T4 in the dog that overrepresent hypothyroidism. But there are very few things that overrepresent hyperthyroidism with an elevated total T4. So that's the difference why we'll see rationally in an elderly cat panels a measurement of a total T4. Okay, let's first talk about hypothyroidism screening tests, those tests that you would do as a first line type of a test. And for all the tests, um, and these these were figured, these were terms that were used by this panel and very uh, concerned about. We're we're going to use two particular um, diagnostic criteria. First of all, sensitivity we're going to define as the fraction of cases that are actually positive, that are labeled as positive by the test, and that means that you want a test as a screening test to be very sensitive. Specificity is the fraction of animals, in this case the euthyroid animals, that have values in the reference range. So that means if the animal shows a normal value, is it really supposed to be in the normal value? Remember, tests are not perfect. So what we look for as a screening test is a high sensitive test that says, okay, hypothyroidism is still in the mix. But secondarily, we want a test, a, a follow-up test that is high in specificity. 
So focusing on the dog and the diagnosis of hypothyroidism, let's take a look at some data. And this data um, is mainly from two papers that I show on the bottom that are now around um, 20 years old. And uh, they focus on, let's start with looking at T4 as a single test for Screening, that is meaning high sensitivity, we see it, it, it is, depending on how you look at it, 89 or one study that removed antibodies, uh, cases with antibodies, uh, almost 100% sensitive in making the diagnosis, uh, I should say, ruling out the diagnosis of hypothyroidism. Now, what do I mean by that? This sensitivity factor, remember, means that if we measure total G4, and it's in the normal range, that means we are ruling out hypothyroidism. So that's why if, in fact, you rule out an antibody, at least based on one study, and you find a, norm, uh, a T4 that's in the normal range, you pretty much can rule out hypothyroidism. Um, notice that this value for total T3 is much lower. So T, we don't think T3 should be used as a screening test at all. TSH, and we'll talk about some of the reasons for this later, um, being elevated um, is about, anywhere, about 80%, let's say, um, as, as a sensitive test. It's, it would be, if it was for human disease, human patients, that test is, value is close to 100%. Our test in veterinary medicine is not as sensitive or, um, and, and also has some other issues that confound it. Now let's talk about specificity. So getting to tests that are uh, specific, that is, if total T4 is low, then this is about 80% specific. Um, T3 actually is a little higher and TSH is a little higher. Um, so we will talk about value of using tests together, not uh, particularly TSH with either T4, total T4, or free T4 uh, in future slides. But for now, let's focus on total T4 because it's a relatively common and cheaper um, diagnostic, endocrine diagnostic test to perform. Realize that total T4 and free T4 normal ranges, as I mentioned before, can be lower in sight hounds. Age, total T4 can lower T, uh, be lower with age. Illness, T4, particularly severe illness, will or, or type that is um, ICU type of illness, will fall very dramatically and sometimes is not measurable. Um, in Obesity, the situation is a little bit opposite of that, um, that T4 and free T4 will be higher. So, but drugs, most drugs that are highly protein bound will lead to lower. So the general principle is there are many things that lower total T4 um, with the rare exception of obesity um, that tends to, I mean, we're talking about morbid obesity that may lead to, lead, or lead to higher total T4 and free T4. Okay, okay, so how do we interpret total T4? Let's be very specific about this. If the T4 is normal and you are suspecting hypothyroidism, it rules out hypothyroidism with around 90% certainty. That's a pretty good um, screening test that has 90% uh, sensitivity. And as I said before, that figure can go up to 100% if you also measure anti-T4 antibodies to make sure that that T4 value is accurate. Um, if there are T4 antibodies, the T4 immunoassay uh, basically becomes worthless. Secondly, if, there, if T4 is low and you suspect hypothyroidism, realize you're not confirming it. It could be illness. Uh, and that's the third part, that illness and drugs, if they're present, you may get lower total T4 values. And by the, for that matter, also T3. If T4 is low and there are no drugs present, then you may want to uh, use 
TSH and free T4 to help confirm. And then we'll talk about these tests as confirmation tests. I briefly want to mention total T3, but I've got a big X here because I want you pretty much to not think about it for routine measurement when you are asking the question of whether the animal is hypothyroid or for that matter hyperthyroid. And for all the reasons which I'm going to let you read here, um, we have uh, technical and physiological reasons why T3 is not a good screening test in particular. Now how about using TSH by itself for screening? As I said, this is the routine in human medicine. Um, in general, a high value of TSH would add specificity to the measurement of a, of a low, I'm make, make sure that's clear, low free T4 or low T4. And yet, um, it is a poor screening test. Why? Because 15 to 25 percent of hypothyroid dogs, otherwise proven to be hypothyroid, can't have normal TSH. And we puzzled over this for a, a number of years, and, and there are two basic reasons. One is we know that dogs are different from humans, and that actually as uh, the animal becomes hypothyroid, TSH may rise early in disease, but eventually it seems to top out and then slowly falls. And we're not sure about all the mechanisms for this. And secondly, we know, and this is true in people and in dogs, that, that um, pulsatile release uh, occurs in hypothyroid dogs. It's more dramatic in, in the hypothyroid state because there's a bigger uh, change of TSH. And yet, this probably doesn't explain fully any value that would be um, falling back into the normal range. It usually doesn't overlap the normal range if the animal has, should have a high TSH. Okay, and this gets down to the, the simple take-home points for screening tests for hypothyroidism in the dog. First of all, total T4 alone for screening, misses only 10% of hypothyroid dogs if it is normal. And, and it may miss almost none if you also rule out antibodies uh, making that T4 value um, technically incorrect. Secondly, T3 values are generally poor screening tests, so forget them. And third, TSH is a poor screening test in general for primary hypothyroidism but you'll see its strength comes in as an adjunct test to confirm um, or be used in addition to measurement of total T4 and free T4. Okay, so this gets to how do we confirm hypothyroidism in the dog. That is, when the total T4 is low, and euthyroidism is not confirmed. And remember how, see how I phrased it. Euthyroidism is not confirmed. Now this gets us to tests that I've alluded to already. Measurement of free T4. Uh, and generally this is the unbound or available hormone to tissues. Um, it's about 0.1% in dogs and cats. And it turns out that it's the single test, when measured alone, which we generally don't recommend, that has the highest diagnostic sensitivity, specificity, and I'll add another term, accuracy. Therefore, it correlates well with the clinical state if it is measured by dialysis procedures, which mo many of the good diagnostic labs are, are still providing. Uh, but you'll find there are non-dialysis methods out there that are less accurate. And when are they less accurate? Just when you need them. They're less accurate in the presence of illnesses and drugs. And in conditions, these are conditions which displace thyroid hormone binding from serum proteins. Now I'll mention just one reason why these tests don't, that are non-dialysis don't work so well for the dog and the cat. And that is that the serum binding proteins for which these tests were designed were for humans. These are tests perfected for human um, samples. 
And the serum binding proteins in dogs and cats are of a different composition. They're much less of a certain type of uh, binding protein called thyroxin binding globulin in those. And so these um, non-dialysis procedures are less accurate, and particularly when you need them to be more accurate. So the key thing here to a dialysis procedure is that it, it allows all of the things that we know can mess up um, the interaction that's shown as an equilibrium here uh, between the unbound T free T4 and the bound T4. Um, and all of this can occur, and if it influences the free T4, all of that will be measurable in the dialysate. So let's compare now, um, again, sensitivity and specificity of total T4, which we talked about before, and now free T4. Notice what free T4 provides us. It, it, it also is just about as good from the standpoint of sensitivity as a single test, but it is even better for specificity. Remember, specificity is that the value will be in the normal range when the animal is supposed to be in the normal range that is euthyroid. And so that's why free T4 measured as a sole test is, has, some, has considerable value in the dog particularly. So let's look at that. So let's, let's remind ourselves the, what TSH by itself was able to give us, and that's about 80% sensitivity and maybe 85 to 90% specificity Remember, we're talking about elevated TSH. As a screening test, remember, it's not very good by itself because we're missing these percentage of 15 to 25 percentage of animals that we know are hypothyroid and they don't have an elevated TSH like they're supposed to. So um, when you combine T4 and TSH, you're not improving the sensitivity very much, but you definitely improve specificity. And you notice the same thing with free T4. So TSH is adding value by creating specificity. There are very few things that falsely elevate TSH. There are some things that keep it low. But when it's elevated, it's of great value because it suggests a lack of circulating thyroid hormone. Okay, some take-home points for confirmation tests for hypothyroidism in the dog. Free T4 is a single test with highest sensitivity and specificity. It should be measured under the following circumstances as an adjunct usually. When you have non-thyroidal illness, when you have presence of drugs that are highly protein bound like NSAIDs, and when you have, and I haven't mentioned this before, but the presence of anti-T4 autoantibodies because that dialysis chamber will isolate those antibodies and all the effects the antibodies might have on the available free T4 will be shown in the dialysis system. And TSH is a poor screening test for primary hypothyroidism, but it adds value and specificity when a low total T4 and free T4 are measured concurrently. Now let's take a look at the cat and hyperthyroidism. What are the screening tests that we might use to evaluate an animal that we think um, could be hyperthyroid. And I've also add, in the case of the cat, we may use these in elderly animals where we know the incidence of hyperthyroidism goes up. So I need to trot out there our little diagram again. Uh, we're going to talk about glandular hyperfunction as a general endocrine abnormality, but specifically about um, feline hyperthyroidism caused by a functional thyroid tumor. And what I'm showing you here could either be bilateral or, in this case, we're showing a unilateral uh, enlargement of a thyroid gland. And remember, what that does is it leads to a high amount of thyroid hormone, therefore a high effect on the animal's tissues, the clinical state of hyperthyroidism, and high amounts of negative feedback. Now, where, what happens in this case is it, although we can't measure it, TRH is low, we can measure TSH and it will be low and I'll go ahead and tell you that in, it is essentially unmeasurable in the cat. 
It's undetectable in most hyperthyroid cats, if not all. And um, again, we don't have a specific assay to measure it in the cat, but we tend to use the dog assay, which is, um, measures for every molecule of TSH, it's measuring about a third of that in the cat. So there's some cross-reactivity. And we said the hormone or the free hormone are going to be elevated. So this is our negative feedback system at work, and we'll come back to that with some of our adjunct testing that we can do in the cat. Okay, in this slide, this is one of the better recent studies of many, many cases that have been uh, almost, almost a, over 900 cases of untreated hyperthyroidism and uh, comparing it with uh, 32 cats without hyperthyroidism. And you can see that um, total T4 almost always is outside the normal range, um, whereas uh, animals that are, that are suspect um, or euthyroid will have normal total T4. The same thing occurs for T3, but you notice there's a little more overlap um, in this case with the normal range. So total T3, while it's helpful if it's elevated, it doesn't, uh, it's not something we recommend routinely. And notice that free T4 also is elevated with in the hyperthyroid patient uh, with the key and con somewhat concerning um, a exception of a few cases. And we'll point out that there are some where uh, cats that are either uh, borderline or for whatever reason, free T4 um, is not uh, in the, uh, the elevated stage. Also notice, and this is a little bit bothersome, that there are some that are outside the range of, in the normal patient. So that means there's a false positive possibility with free T4. Now, if you look at total T4, there's a little bit of that, and uh, even with T3 a little bit as well. Uh, but there's a lot of concern about the fact that free T4 uh, can be falsely elevated in, in a euthyroid cat because of the implications that it, it has for the, the type of treatment and the cost of treatment in an aged animal. So we, um, but I would point out that the value of, of supplementing or confirming an elevated total T4 uh, by measuring free T4 is, uh, outweighs the approximately 5% over um, estimation of hyperthyroidism um, due to free T4. So the point is you should use free T4 and total T4 together um, and as well as supplementing clinical observations. So let's take a look at TSH in this study and it's interesting to note that the um, hyperthyroid animals where the normal range basically is essentially unmeasurable, and this is the, the undetectable level um, for cats right here. Um, and so the problem is that while there are some that are in the normal range, the vast majority are undetectable. And, 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 and in addition, the vast majority a certain significant number of euthyroid animals are the same thing. So we have a great overlap in TSH uh, in the hyperthyroid patient to the extent that, yeah, you would expect TSH to be unmeasurable in, a, in, a, in most hyperthyroid patients, but you're going to find uh, around two-thirds of euthyroid patients also having uh, undetectable TSH. So it's not a very valuable um, Thing to measure in the cat. So to summarize our main take-home points about screening tests for hyperthyroidism in the cat, um, T4 alone is the most commonly employed because they're tests because there are very few factors that falsely elevate it and, and it's used in aged cats as a result to screen for hyperthyroidism. If you find T4 is borderline or normal, 
then it can be helpful to show that T3 or free T4 is elevated to support your diagnosis. But we'll also suggest other tests uh, in the next section. Um, measuring TSH in the cat using the canine assay is generally undetectable in all cats, but it, due to a lack of sensitivity, it's also about two-thirds of youth thyroid cats also have undetectable TSH. So not very sensitive or specific. I'd like to use this diagram from this uh, paper by Dr. Peterson um, that I thought was a very good one summarizing the diagnostic testing procedures for cats with hy suspected hyperthyroidism. So if you have clinical signs in history, measure total T4. If it's high, diagnosis confirmed, you're done. Obviously, things aren't always that simple. What if you have a high normal T4? Then you may need to still uh, suspect hyperthyroidism and see if there's other diseases that may be lowering T4 into the normal range, in which case you can treat that disease and then go on to see if it's still T4 is elevated. If it's still elevated, you can measure free T4 and TSH, remember I said TSH should be undetectable, or go on to using other tests like a thyroid scintigraphy or T3 suppression test. We'll talk about that later. If your T4 is coming back up to here, if your T4 is normal, then you basically refute the diagnosis if you you may want to recheck the animal in six months. If you still suspect that the animal has hyperthyroidism, then you may want to go through testing again at a later time or do additional diagnostic testing. So how does this test work in the normal euthyroid animal? Uh, we give them a bunch of T3, this acts just like free T4, free T3 can act at the negative feedback mechanism at the pituitary, at the hypothalamus in the pituitary. TRH presumably goes down, TSH goes down. In T4, secretion should go down. That's the normal response of an animal giving a, a, a super, super physiological amount of thyroid hormone. Now, the key thing here is to realize that T3 and T4 are different, different enough that, they can, that you can measure T4 after having given T3. That's all you need to know. But what if the animal is hyperthyroid, you give the same T3? Well, guess what? All of this that I talked about before has been accomplished already by the animal's own free T4 being elevated, and therefore TRH is already low, TSH is already low, and therefore, T4 will not change. And if it isn't already grossly elevated to begin with, it will not fall any further. Now, what is the problem with using, say, the T3 suppression test or scintigraphy as adjuncts uh, for confirmation of disease? Both are relatively poor, poor in their specificity. They don't necessarily distinguish between severely sick hyperthyroid cats from sick euthyroid cats. Um, and so uh, while we use them and they're useful when they show clear results, we cannot um, fully depend on these tests either with regards to uh, their always giving us um, the correct story.